thank you very much, Richard, for that introduction. It makes me feel just a tad older than my 85 years, I can tell you. But uh, it, it, it was a great surprise when I got this invitation to give this lecture because I thought, you know, I'm pretty well past it. But uh, it is a historic lecture, so I'll do my best. And uh, uh, the first uh, thing I should do is acknowledge the... Uh, experimental physiology, and particularly Diana Jones in the office, who has enabled me to get this talk online, uh, and it's in, freely available in the press uh, today. So thank you, Diana. Uh, I'm not very good with uh, online submissions and things like that, and she helped me through the process tremendously. Well, I remember Bill Payton, Sir William Payton, very well because he was around uh, when I was in Oxford uh, first. Uh, I've been in Oxford actually uh, uh, for 50 years uh, this year, which is a fair time, uh, but it's qualified a bit because in one of the Christmas shows uh, that the students put on in Oxford where they take the mickey out of you, uh, they said, what is the difference between God and peace light? And the answer was, God is everywhere, but peace light is never in Oxford. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Bill Payton was a, a, a tremendous uh, influence, a, a very nice man personally, and I like the one on the left much better than those rather grim portraits on the right. But uh, Payton and Zymis published this lecture, uh, published this paper, as you see in uh, British Journal of Pharmacology in 1949, and the commentary at the time says, it's ostensibly a purely pharmacological investigation, but it's actually contributed uh, as much to physiology as to pharmacology, and certainly it contributed to the treatment of hypertension too, because when I qualified in, well, when I started medicine in 1947 in Cambridge, there was absolutely no treatment for hypertension, which is unbelievable now when you think about it. And since then, it's just steadily uh, accreted, but this was the first drug that would, would control uh, hypertension. And he uh, did it with Eleanor Zymis, who is still alive, I'm told, in, in Greece, uh, and she was a splendid uh, uh, woman. And uh, at a medical research society meeting uh, in Oxford, I got interested in blood pressure during sleep because of this work by Bevan, Honor, and Stott in Sir George Pickering's department, where they did the first beat to beat intraarterial blood pressure recordings in the world and in ambulant people. So this was one of George Pickering's registrars uh, wearing this apparatus for recording his own blood pressure beat to beat through the day uh, in, in the hospital and at home at night. And Eleanor Zymis, uh, I'll come to that in a moment, she was there at this presentation and you will see that there are two spikes that stick out there. The first one was when George Pickering had uh, asked his ward sister to stick a pin in the bottom of his registrar, Alan Bevan, and in those days you could use your house staff as guinea pigs, that's no longer allowed, unfortunately, but uh, she stuck a, a pin in there, much to his surprise, and the other uh, one here is the first recording of human coitus, the blood pressure in human coitus, when he went home and did his duty by his wife. And, and it looked pretty alarming, but when you think about it, it can't be that alarming, because <laughs> the survival is quite good after it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was interested in the fall in blood pressure uh, during sleep, and I was interested in what was controlling blood pressure uh, during sleep. But anyway, uh, 
Eleanor Zymis saw this at a medical research society meeting which I was at in, in, in Oxford, and she crossed her uh, arms across her, I should say, ample uh, chest, and she said, hmm, she said, just like an Englishman, once and he goes to sleep. <laughs> but, but it's a great privilege to give this lecture, as I say. Uh, uh, when, when I got the invitation, I thought, well, they're a bit daft, and I, and I said yes, and I didn't think much about it, until I looked at the previous patent lectures, uh, you know, including people like Dennis Noble, and I took great fright, and I thought, well, <laughs> that was a big error, and it may still be a big error, but I'll do my best. And uh, he, uh, John Coote, uh, gave this lecture uh, before, and you can see uh, uh, he dealt really with the central nervous system. And he said, uh, in this I've tried to trace the key experiments that have developed ideas on how the brain regulates the cardiovascular system. And uh, he said, I have not been able to cover areas such as the nucleus tractus solitarius and the cardiac vagal uh, neurons, although I acknowledge that some may consider it's a bit incomplete without them. So I'm, uh, it gave me an opportunity to, to cover this subject. And, uh, well, I, as you see, I, none of you will know who the hell I am, uh, but I, I, I still do work and I enjoy it, and when I don't enjoy it, I'll give up. Uh, but I've, um, my main work now is in being on data monitoring committees for very large international clinical trials, and I chair about seven of these. And uh, it keeps you up to date because you're ahead of the rest of the field in the data monitoring committee. You're seeing the results as, as it comes in. I trained at Cambridge and Barts, and I was an HP at Barts, and then at the Brompton, where I fell under the influence of a New Zealander called Paul Wood. Uh, who was incredibly nasty to all the consultants in cardiology in London at the time, but incredibly nice to any students who sat at his feet. And soon, uh, I was a chest house physician at the Brompton, and soon, like nearly all the chest house physicians, I was learning cardiology from Paul Wood, and it was a marvelous experience. And uh, through that, I got uh, interested in cardiology, and then I went to work for uh, another man who died about a couple of years ago, 90-something, Aubrey Leatham. And then uh, I was feeling pretty good. I'd been promised the next uh, consultant job at St. George's Hospital. And when I uh, turned up for the interview, I didn't get the job. And the reason was that somebody turned up in English who'd been seven years in the States, and he'd published about 10 times more papers than I had. And so they said to me, uh, Slight, uh, you've got to go to the United States and publish. And so I went out to California. And I actually went, first of all, to Maurice Socolow. And those of you who know anything about the ECG, Maurice Socolow uh, developed uh, uh, an interest in the electrocardiogram. And the Socolow index of left ventricular hypertrophy is named after Maurice Socolow. So when I got out there, after a bit, about three weeks, he said, Peter, he said, uh, I can't teach you any clinical cardiology. You better go and see uh, Julius Comro in the Institute. And I, he was then called Julius Comro Jr. He still it was. And I thought this must be the son of the great Comro, but of course it turned out it was Comro himself. Uh, but he was on sabbatical uh, when I was there. Uh, but uh, uh, he was absolutely inspirational. He changed my career completely from a Harley Street cardiology to uh, doing uh, research. And I had a midlife crisis where I didn't know whether I was going to be a physiologist or a cardiologist. But uh, I was lucky in San Francisco, and I stumbled on a reflex uh, from the heart and I wanted to record impulses from these, the receptors of this reflex in the left ventricle. And so uh, uh, Julius said, well, we'll fund you for another year, 
uh, go and see X in the physiology department and learn how long it will take you uh, to dissect single fibers. So I went and I was told it would take three years. So I said to Uncle Julius, I don't have three years. I'm, you know, 32 and life's going on. And so he said, oh, there's a chap called John Widdicombe in Oxford who's been out here before and likes San Francisco. We'll pay for him to come and work with you and he can pick the fibers and you can help with the experimentation. So I said, yes, that was great. But John Widdicombe, unfortunately, couldn't come for domestic reasons. And so uh, Julius, uh, so John Widdicombe, not knowing I was English, said, well, why doesn't this chap come to Oxford? So uh, the American Fellowship funded me for four months in Oxford, uh, where I, I went to uh, uh, s experiment with John Widdicombe, who was a lovely man. But after we had the second animal that we tested, we got C fibers from the heart from this, these receptors. And at that time, C fibers, unmyelinated fibers, were only known uh, from the skin, from IGO and, and people like that. Uh, so it was really quite a, a, a fillip to get C fibers from the heart, and I was very excited. And then John Whittacombe said, well, I'm going away from holiday for four weeks. And I said, you can't. I said, I've only got f four months here. You can't go away for four weeks. So he said, well, I've gone, I'm going. <laughs> and so uh, I said, well, I've been watching you. Do you mind if I, I have a go myself with your stuff, your, your lab, while, uh, while you're away? And uh, he came back three weeks later, and, and I got another seven fibers. So. Uh, uh, that's how long it takes to actually learn. Never, to the young here, never believe what you're told by your bosses about how long it will take. It never takes as long as they say. And then uh, this was the, uh, the first paper. I mean, now to get a single author paper is absolutely incredible. Uh, but in those days it was possible. And, and, uh, and so that was published in J. Fiziol in 64, and I uh, presented it at a meeting of the FISSOC, but actually one month later, the Coleridge's at the Royal Free presented very similar data from C fibers from the heart, uh, uh, and so it was a sort of absolutely neck and neck uh, with this uh, publication. And then John and I uh, published uh, this paper in, in J. Physiol, which you've heard about. And here's an early photograph uh, which I took. I'm sorry for the quality of it, but this is Linda Brown in the coffee room in physiology in 1963. And there's John Widdicombe uh, on his bike in uh, Pump Lane or something like that in Oxford. And they were both marvelous chaps to work for. And I got actually invited back uh, by, I think, Linda Brown and George Pickering had been having a drop too much port after dinner and having a discussion about this no bridge between physiology in Oxford and clinical medicine in Oxford. And then Linda Brown must have said, well, there's this chap Slight who's been, I understand he's a clinician, but he also is a physiologist. So I was summoned to a bench on Paddington Station for an interview with George Pickering. And uh, it's a curious place to be, have a job interview, but George Pickering was then leaving St. Mary's and oscillating between St. Mary's and Oxford while he set up shop in Oxford. Uh, here are some pictures that I dug out from a meeting uh, for the Coleridge's, uh, John Coleridge's uh, uh, retirement uh, party in, in uh, Davis, California. And uh, both of these are unfortunately dead, and uh, Beppe Sant'Ambrosio was a very good friend. And there's Hazel Coleridge, who's still alive, and actually, by some curious coincidence, lives in the same village, Wheatley, that I live in near Oxford. And she's got all her marbles. She remembers this time better than I do. And she was a great help in putting this talk together. 
Uh, but she was also, they were also very generous because when I'd left Oxford, I had never set foot in the hospital. I'd just been four months in physiology. And I went back to Hyde Park Corner to St. George's where my job was. Uh, but I wanted to go on doing this work. I was sort of hooked on, on listening to the loudspeaker in the middle of the night. And uh, uh, the Coleridge's very generously uh, lent me their lab for one day a week. It, it was absolutely tremendous. And here is uh, John Coleridge's Festschrift. Uh, it was organized by Tisa Capagoda, who was in Leeds, but then in Davis, in Davis, California. And you can see Hazel here and John behind, and quite a lot of uh, Cecil Kidd I can see there, and so on. There are quite a lot of people. I don't know the names of all of them. And there's uh, uh, John Coleridge and Julian Hoffman. Julian Hoffman's still alive, and he taught everybody statistics. He was a clinician, but he, a physiologist, but he taught statistics. I've had about three courses in statistics in my life, but I still don't trust myself to use the right test. So uh, I, I go to Richard Pito now when I need some, some help like that. But Julian uh, uh, did his best to teach me statistics, but didn't really succeed. And there is uh, Ron Linden, uh, uh, now dead, unfortunately. Uh, he's smiling, which he didn't do very often, actually. He was a pretty fierce chap, and in fact, he edited those, those papers in the Journal of Physiology, and he was really quite uh, severe. And uh, some of the speculation which I'd put in, which turned out later to be true, he said it would be bad advertisement to put this in, because it could be wrong. So I, I had to listen to what he said. And there's uh, uh, Cecil Kidd and David Mary and Roger Hainsworth. And here is Jerry Mitchell also at that meeting. And there he is sitting four or five rows back, looking pretty well the same, I'd say. And uh, uh, it was a great party. Then, uh, as I say, I got invited back to Oxford on an MRC uh, fellowship to begin with. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, George Pickering is looking very happy there. Again, he didn't look very happy most of the time. And uh, uh, he's looking happy there because he's going to partake of Lord Crewe's benefaction. I can re recommend this to anybody who has uh, in charge of degree ceremonies where people don't turn up because Lord Crewe endowed uh, in perpetuity uh, money to give champagne, strawberries, and peaches to doctors of divinity, uh, civil law, law, and medicine uh, in the University of Oxford. So if I'm in Oxford in June for the degree ceremony, uh, I front up for that because it's a very agreeable thing. You process then, you then process in a sort of haze to the Sheldonian Theatre for the degree ceremony, and you sleep happily through this for the next uh, <laughs> one hour, and uh, and it's terrific. But that's uh, that's that. So in fact, I got the best of both worlds because. I had a post that was split between physiology with my own lab. Uh, when I got to back, I thought I'd be working with John Widdicombe. And Linda Brown said, oh, no, no, no. She said, you should have your own lab, you see. So I said, uh, it'll be very expensive, sir. And so he said, uh, how expensive? And I said, I don't know, but very expensive. So he said, well, uh, figure it out and come back in a few days and tell me uh, what it'll cost. And I went back with a shopping list for Tektronix six-channel scopes and other stuff that was pretty expensive, even at that time. And I gave it to him, and he looked at it. He said, OK, he said, uh, you order it, and I'll ring up the MRC and fix it. Well, I mean, marvelous way to get a grant, isn't it, these days? <laughs> if you could do that, life would be a lot easier, I think. Anyway, uh, that's what happened. And then I got elected to the committee of the Physiology Society. I think they needed sort of tame clinical medicine to keep them in touch with reality. And so I was that person. 
and I was fortunate to time it well because in the mid 70s the Physiology Society had their 100th anniversary and Dennis uh, uh, somehow persuaded the Irish chef at Balliol College in Oxford uh, I think his name was Pat Moen. I don't know if De uh, Dennis will correct me, but I remember the name because he was a nice chap. And he persuaded him to put on a replica of the previous dinner a la Russe, as it was then in 1876 or 8, uh, which had f something like 13 or 15 different courses. And then uh, we got up from this splendid dinner at about midnight, and I was then uh, attached to New College, so I'd organized for us to have dessert in the Founders Library at New College. And uh, we got out of that at about two in the morning in a pretty hazy state, I can tell you. But it was a very, very nice occasion. And uh, he also had inspired dinners at the Garrick Club. I don't know if this goes on still in physiology committees, but it was marvellous then. There was only one committee, actually, at the time. Now you've got hundreds, I gather. Well, uh, to get to some science. Uh, <laughs> sorry about all that. Uh, but at, uh, in the 1960s, I was involved in arguments with Arthur Guyton, who'd written a huge textbook of physiology and was in Jackson, Mississippi, and was a great influence. And he put it about, he had this circuit diagram of the circulation, and it had uh, uh, no uh, control of, of the kidney in it, by nervous control of the kidney at all. He believed in pressure, naturesis, and things like that. But I had studied some patients uh, who, and so he said that uh, the baroreceptors and the baroreflex just contr uh, control short-term fluctuations in blood pressure, and there's nothing to do with long-term blood pressure levels. And I'd studied some patients who had had uh, carotid denervation uh, for asthma. This was a, a Japanese idea, which turned out to be absolutely, completely crazy. But uh, uh, they, they believed that if you took out the carotid body, it would help people with asthma and stop uh, vasoconstriction, uh, pulmonary constriction from the uh, carotid body, uh, body. But the surgeons asked to uh, remove this body, which you can't see, uh, made damn certain to get it by stripping the whole of this bifurcation down to the media, uh, and so they denervated the uh, sinus nerves at the same time as getting the carotid body. So it didn't help the asthma, but it certainly gave people hypertension. And I studied some people who were completely normotensive and then became hypertensive straight after this operation, which I'm glad to say is no longer done. But the person who uh, really uh, uh, proved that the carotids actually cause sustained hypertension is this chap Thrasher, who, who was actually an American US surgeon uh, at the time, trainee surgeon. And he did this nice experiment where he isolated the carotid sinus. And then when he lowered the pressure in the carotid sinus, he saw sustained hypertension over some days in these dogs. And uh, attempts to stimulate the carotid sinus nerve go back a long way. Uh, I was involved also, we tried to do it, we put electrodes around the carotid sinus nerve and it certainly worked for a week or two. But the trouble is that when you dissect out the nerve and then you put electrodes around it to stimulate it chronically with a thing like a pacemaker, uh, the trouble is that it destroyed the blood supply to the carotid sinus nerve so it didn't last. But now there are there are new techniques which will avoid this. And uh, with regard to non-drug treatment of hypertension, uh, this is now, this baroreceptor pacing is now uh, a very successful method which I predict is going to catch on in a big way. Uh, renal denervation was the other way, was to denervate the sympathetics from the renal arteries and this was pioneered in Melbourne by Murray Esler. And recently, as I will tell you, it's come under a bit of a cloud. 
Anyway, I went to examine Ingrid Sheffer's thesis in, uh, in Maastricht in 2010, and uh, uh, they have kept in touch with me ever since. Uh, and uh, Ingrid Sheffer, I think, now works for Medtronic making pacemakers for carotid sinuses. But here is a, a, key, a key slide. And it's taken in a man who three months earlier uh, had had this pacemaker implanted on his carotid sinus, this new model, which I'll talk about. And you can see before, before the thing was switched on, it was about 2.25, uh, 1, 10 or 15, so he had substantial hypertension. And then the minute you switch on this pacemaker for nine minutes, you, you dial the blood pressure down, and it's then completely normal. And then when you switch it off, up it goes again, and so on. And you can repeat this, and it shows that this isn't a placebo effect, it's, it's something physiological. And here's a child's guide uh, to the, the reflex, which I don't really have to tell this society, but it acts through uh, the autonomic and sympathetic and parasympathetic on the heart, on the vessels, and on the kidneys, particularly uh, involved in nervous control of naturesis and renin secretion. Uh, that's now co corrected in Gatton's textbook, I'm glad to say. But these are Ingrid Sheffer's first uh, 20 or so patients, and you can see that there's a really substantial fall uh, in systolic and diastolic pressure. And it certainly was no worse, if anything, a little better uh, a couple of years down the line. And then uh, the main paper with Peter Deleu and then some other authors here uh, was published in the Journal of the American College in, in 2010. And in this, they showed a sustained reduction of blood pressure over four years by chronic stimulation of the carotid sinus nerve. And again, no evidence over this four years, and I've seen results uh, not published yet over five years, no evidence at all of any diminution of the effect of carotid sinus nerve stimulation. And uh, uh, I think uh, when this device catches on more, it will become cheaper and will become a very viable alternative to drug treatment. And the problem about drug treatment is that people tell the doctors they, tell the drug, uh, they take the drugs, but if you dig up the flower beds outside hospitals, they're full of pills. And so uh, they don't actually take the drugs. Uh, only uh, obsessional people like me take the drugs, but I have a holiday every weekend. Uh, 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 but uh, it, it's, it's hard to take drugs regularly. Now, the device that they first had was like this, and instead of dissecting the carotid sinus nerve, they put these finger-like extensions round the carotid sinus uh, and, and stimulated both sides, and the device was, as you see, uh, quite large. Uh, this is about the size of a modern cardiac pacemaker and is what they use now, and they found that they can get the same effect from just one side. The right side is better than the left side, I'm told, but they can, a little disc put over the right area of the carotid sinus without any interference with the nerves. And that's uh, lasting much longer and better. Uh, this is a commercial slide provided by the manufacturers, but it shows a little slit in the neck, which is the only uh, uh, thing they have. So it's a pretty uh, innocuous procedure now. And if you look at the difference between that first generation, this big one, in the terms of uh, percent free from complications, well, in the original one, about 60% were free of complications later, but in the second generation, it's about 95%. So, and this will get better as people get 
more experience with it, and there's just this little disc electrode put over the carotid sinus. They, of course, move it around uh, in the operating theatre to find the best area and then, and then just stitch it onto the adventitia there without any interference with the nerves. But perhaps what will turn out to be more important with this device is not to lower blood pressure, but to treat heart failure. Treating heart failure now is terrible. It, it's really, uh, you get a few months more of life. Uh, but the drugs to treat heart failure are not very successful, and uh, they, they are, are hard to take. Uh, but with this device, uh, you can uh, treat heart failure very effectively by reducing sympathetic activity and increasing parasympathetic activity. And here is a pressure volume loop. Here's the LV pressure, and here's the change in LV volume. And it's quite uh, high, the LV volume, at the beginning of systole, and then it goes like this. And then if you put on the stimulation, you can see you get a much bigger stroke volume at a much lower pressure. So I think this, again, is going to be a thing to watch for the future. I think it has a big place uh, in a disease which is very difficult to treat with drugs. And you can, uh, with this device now, uh, you can actually uh, turn a knob and, and dial up the stimulation that you give to the carotid sinus. And of course, if you give too much, it's painful and people don't like it. So you, you tweak it until you get something that doesn't bother the patient, but does control their blood pressure. Now, I'm going to switch tack completely now and talk about uh, renal uh, denervation to remove the sympathetic nerves from the kidneys. And you can do this by a catheter up from the leg into the renal artery. It helps, of course, if you've got a single renal artery, and not everybody does have. Uh, but you can then pu push this catheter up and hopefully destroy these nerves. I say hopefully because here is where the nerves are. They're in the adventitia of the renal artery, and there's a thick media, and there's the vessel lumen where you're trying to burn the adventitia. So it's tricky, and it does demand, I think, a lot of experience uh, to do this properly. And Murray Esler in Melbourne uh, has developed this method uh, based on a lot of animal work beforehand, and, and uh, they have published uh, trials uh, uh, using this catheter. Uh, and the idea is you put the catheter in, and uh, some have multiple electrodes all the way around and burn in different places around the renal artery. And uh, some you just put it in and burn in different spots. Uh, but it, it definitely lowers blood pressure in the right hands. And here's their first trial, Simplicity 1, with office blood pressures. And you can see substantial reduction with renal uh, denervation, which lasts here up to two years. And this was Simplicity 1. And Simplicity 2 uh, used uh, um, an international multicenter trial and they got very similar results. About 33 over 11 fall in blood pressure, uh, which was uh, very impressive. And I guess in Europe, where this device was licensed, uh, maybe 10,000 people or more have had this, had this treatment. In the US, though, uh, the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, demanded a more severe test, and they demanded that the patients didn't know what had happened, and the, the physicians looking after them didn't know what had happened, and everybody had to have a catheter passed into their renal artery, and then randomly half of them were denervated. And when this was done, and it was published in January this year in the New England Medical Journal, uh, when this was done, 
it, pro it proved uh, negative, and it was done in several hundred people, so it wasn't a small uh, test, and it uh, uh, really has caused a lot of discussion. It was presented in March, uh, and then published uh, in the New England Journal under the name of BAT, and uh, they found a difference between whites and blacks. Now, I've learned from Richard Pito uh, that subgroup analysis, particularly of a trial which is negative, uh, subgroup analysis, uh, as Richard Pito puts it, it's fun to look at, but don't believe it. And it turns out that this seems to work in uh, whites, but not in blacks, but we'll have to see. There is some argument that maybe uh, hyper in the States, to do a trial like this, you've got to include 40%, the US percentage of black people, you've got to include 40% blacks in any trial. And in the previous trials, there had been very few, if any, blacks. So there may be a difference between blacks and whites, but remember what Richard says. Here is the results, both for office blood pressure on the left and ambulatory blood pressure where you wear a cuff and there are no doctors involved on the right. And you can see that between denervation and sham, there is absolutely uh, no difference. And, and, uh, and so, there's been a lot of debate about this. And some people said they should stop doing this. Uh, Franz Messerli, who's a well-known Swiss, who's a hypertension doctor in New York now, he said, you can forget about renal denervation as a method of treating hypertension. But in Europe, it's still going on. And uh, Rob Califf, who's a good friend of mine from Duke, he said uh, it's a good example of why it's necessary <clears throat> to do proper clinical trials. And uh, he said it seemed obvious from simplicity one and two that this thing worked, but when you do a proper blinded trial, uh, it doesn't look so good. And then uh, uh, Stop Press in uh, June the, uh, last year, uh, and, and then uh, published uh, just uh, in a meeting uh, statement uh, uh, recently, these two people uh, have got some further information uh, of that trial. First of all, this is not the trial, this is a registry data, not people randomized, but you can see from this that if you took all patients, they had their blood pressure lowered about 12 millimeters of mercury systolic. But if you took people who were really hypertensive in the office before, or with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, the result was more impressive. And we, may, we need to look more at that as well. But in the trial itself, the negative trial that I showed you on the first slide, uh, there's this difference between uh, non-African Americans, white Americans, who you can see have a substantial reduction uh, with the stimulation uh, versus placebo, uh, whereas African Americans uh, uh, were non-significantly uh, higher, no effect. But they've done a further analysis of the Simplicity trial, uh, just published uh, last week, and you can see here that the more stimulations, the more burning attempts were made, the better the result. Because if you had uh, people who were more persistent, uh, they got better results in the differences between sham and placebo, which I'll remind you in the whole study uh, were about the same. But when you look at people who had more attempts at ablation, then it's better. And it is a difficult technique, and we'll just have to see more about this. But even in this trial, there's some suspicion that this method works. And renal denervation uh, works in many experimental hypertensions, uh, like here. I won't go into that. And my conclusions about this is that, uh, uh, first of all, you may have damaged renal afferents as well, and we don't know too much about those, but they may be important. 
and it may be negative because of uh, technical failures. I just want to finish up by talking about music therapy. Uh, I've spent the last uh, 20 years going twice a year uh, to Pavia, working with uh, an Italian uh, physician who's more of a physiologist than a physician called Luciano Bernardi. And it's very enjoyable to go and live like a student twice a year in Italy, so that's no pain at all. And we've had some success with uh, publications about the effect of music on blood pressure and heart rate. And we used power spectral analysis, uh, which was a, a technique for, uh, uh, for altering sympatho, uh, for recording sympathovagal balance in man. Uh, and I went to him, never met him before I went. Uh, he turned out to be much younger than I thought. He wasn't even on the faculty of the university hospital. He was what they call a ricicatore in Italian. And uh, I found that he didn't understand the underlying physiology properly. So I said, Luciana, let us start with young medical students available on the corridor outside instead of diabetic subjects, which are more complicated. And that's what we did. And here is uh, power spectral analysis explained. I'm sorry I'm overrunning by five minutes, but I, I hope I've got some injury time from all that palaver at the beginning, Richard. Uh, so so I'll, I'll be, I won't be very long. But uh, this is a way of looking at sympathovagal balance uh, in, the, in the power spectrum. And uh, if you're lying flat, you can see that the area is larger. You have more autonomic uh, activity when you're lying flat. When you're standing, it's much less variable, and it's mostly in the sympathetic low frequency uh, peak here. This is the peak that corresponds with respiratory sinus arrhythmia and is largely vagal. But you can see that you can use this method. And I went on sabbatical, and here was me 20 years ago, looking a bit slimmer, uh, definitely. And Luciano Bernardi has lost his beard now and is looking more professorial. And Giorgio Finardi was the head of the department. In Italy, uh, you put your predecessor's pictures up on, or well, they are in your office, just to keep you in place and know your position. Uh, in uh, Russia, it's even more severe. When I went to see Pavlov's lab in uh, Leningrad uh, to visit Chernigovsky, I found that in his office, he had three desks before his desks. And Pavlov's desk was massive. So it's quite a thing to clutter up your office with. Uh, just thank God we don't have that system. Uh, heart rate variability, though, is important for prognosis. The more you have, the better. And if you want to while over the next few minutes, uh, take your own pulse, breathing in and breathing out. If there's a big difference between the rate when you breathe in and breathe out, you possibly might live longer. But <laughs> I don't guarantee it. <laughs> and... Uh, it's important uh, for heart failure patients and for hypertension patients, and it really depends on the baroreflex. And we uh, began by studying mental arithmetic, which is a standard uh, technique for raising pressure, and uh, uh, we found it was different doing it aloud uh, compared with doing it scribbling the results on a, back on a blackboard. And that, of course, was due to the fact that when you do it aloud, it slows your breathing down tremendously. And that's the, uh, the key. And we looked for some non-arousing control prose, which wasn't exciting as mental arithmetic. And as we were in Italy, uh, we used the Ave Maria prayer. When I went, I said, well, tell me about this prayer. And they said, oh, it's a thing that everybody says about 50 times during an Italian service. It's just subthalamic level, you do this recitation, it's not exciting, it's a good control for verbalization, uh, uh, like mental arithmetic, only non-exciting. So that's what we did. And then eventually, through various uh, uh, things, that publications, we eventually went to study the effect of music.
Now, I've got to tell you a little uh, simple physiology, which you know. Uh, the baroreceptors uh, give a fantastic pulse record to the central nervous system. I've recorded from single uh, carotid baroreceptors, and the signal they give is much better than any transducer that you've ever seen. It's really a beautiful signal. So the brain gets high-class information, and then it screws up because it sends it within one beat to the pacemaker, but it takes three or four beats to go down the unmyelinated sympathetic. And when you have a control system that has a fast and a slow arm, you cannot get a flat blood pressure. And so you get a hunting, which turns out uh, to be at the frequency of the Meyer waves in blood pressure uh, described many years ago. And we were very surprised when we found that when the Ave Maria prayer is said in Latin, it hits this Maya wave frequency, exactly. And it enhances the blood pressure and hence the vagal slowing and calming effects. And this may be, and it doesn't happen if you do the uh, prayer in Italian, French, or English. And the priests have been very keen on, uh, on uh, translating this Latin into uh, their local language, uh, but the, the, the congregation don't like it because it doesn't feel so comfortable. And the reason is, I think, that the Latin is 10 seconds and the others aren't. And the same thing happens with yoga mantras. And it may be that this slow breathing uh, introduces calm and increased vagal tone. And this is a paper we got into the British Medical Journal in 2001. I have to say it was the Christmas number of the British Medical Journal, so it wasn't, wasn't really regarded as serious. But I think it was serious because it showed the difference between the mantra, slow breathing, and you can see the fall in blood pressure that occurs uh, with the uh, slow breathing. And this prayer arrived about the time when European and Indian cultures uh, mingled in Palestine during the Crusades. And I have a theory, which has no backing whatsoever, that that's how this was transferred from India to the Catholic Church. They thought, well, we can't say yoga mantras. The congregation wouldn't like that, but we can make a prayer that's like a yoga mantra. And I think that's what they did. And anyway, I've skipped these slides because I'm over time. Uh, but we studied different musicians, Bach cantata, and this, here's Verdi, uh, Vapensiera, you know. That's 10 seconds. And Verdi somehow knew this, and I don't know how he knew it, but he uses it a lot in his arias. And here is a, a different plot uh, of coherence uh, uh, between the music envelope and diastolic pressure. And you see this range of hills here, fantastic coherence, and that is at 10 seconds. So Verdi certainly knew what he was doing. And that was published in circulation a couple of years ago. And now uh, music is everywhere, but largely uh, used uh, with somebody's fancy uh, tune to calm somebody in coronary care or something like that. And really, I think you could just play Verdi without any difficulty and not have expensive tapes of patented uh, thing. So my apologies for a long lecture and also uh, it's been a very personal account, but this was suggested to me during the publication process with experimental physiology. They said, uh, uh, why don't you sort of tell it like it was rather than cook up a good story? So that's what I've done. And I've been very happy in my associations with physiology and particularly seeing some old friends at this meeting. And I wouldn't have done this on my own, and there's a list of... Uh, uh, people more or less in chronological order uh, who've helped me over the years. Thank you very much.
been elected to give the vote of thanks, Peter. Uh, so Otherwise, we, you wouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> we thank you very much for a very enlightening and very lively lecture. And thank you for giving us the, the backroom glimpse into research in the 60s and the 70s. I got a little glimpse of that myself, certainly in the 70s. Uh, two points of information uh, in the modern world. The Physiological Society does get to dine as council members. Uh, unfortunately, we no longer dine at the Garrick. Although the Garrick would admit women transiently to dine, they wouldn't admit women at the time uh, for membership. So the Physiological Society decided no. it would not go with the Garrick. They, they do admit women through a side door, though. Yes. <laughs> the other thing you might like to know is that the direct ter telephone line between Oxford and the Medical Research Council appears unfortunately to have been disconnected <laughs> and uh, the telephone company has been uh, unable to reconnect it so I'm afraid that, that that particular tradition has long since gone but thank you for bringing us uh, for giving us the history but also bringing us right up to date uh, with this uh, long-standing debate about renal of volume control and autonomic control of blood pressure. That certainly is an argument in Oxford. It's an argument even uh, down to the level of what we should teach our medical students, whether the baroreceptor is a long-term or a short-term controller. My and God. I'm interested My to God. hear... I think, to think hear things that, have deteriorated that the strongly the debate is, is going on. So, uh, please accept this award for our, on behalf of the Physiological Society. It's a very large glass brick, so I warn you about the weight. And uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Okay, thank you very much.